let me uh, congratulate uh, GAO on its uh, 100 years. The Concord Coalition is turning 29 this year. So for 29 of those 100 years, the Concord Coalition has been a, an avid consumer of GAO products. And, um, you know, two, I guess maybe three issues uh, in particular uh, that we look at the GAO um, produces are the, the long-term outlook report, uh, the debt limit uh, um, report, and high-risk uh, areas that's, you know, really more traditional type of work on looking at duplication and, you know, waste and how efficient uh, programs are. Um, and all three areas are really, really important to the work of the Concord Coalition. Uh, let me let me ask you first about the long-term uh, outlook and ask you to describe that report and why GAO does it. And let me also note that I believe GAO was the first agency to, to produce uh, a long-term budget outlook uh, back in 1992, I think it was. Uh, right. And uh, it's refined uh, the the uh, the process since, but but it it really shows the um, the importance of looking ahead. So this is a very difficult time to do economic and fiscal projections, as we all know. The COVID uh, situation has made it even much worse. But um, describe as you would the the the, the key findings that uh, the GAO has made to Congress uh, on the long term outlook. I'd be happy to, Bob. Actually, between 1993 and 1999, I was the head of our accounting and information technology division in GAO. As we were developing our long-term model, we established a budget group in GAO to complement our sister agency in the legislative branch, the Congressional Budget Office, to do these longer range projections uh, that at that time CBO was not doing. And so we built the model uh, to do these projections. We started out with CBO's analysis and we've done work uh, over the years. The last four years, uh, I've been issuing special reports called the fiscal health of the government, which include the long-term fiscal outlook. We also have worked through uh, the financial accounting standards advisory board that the government has to include a fiscal sustainability statement now in the federal government's financial statements that are produced by the Treasury Department in consultation with OMB. So those financial statements include long range projections as well. CBO has extended its projections. And so uh, the bottom line is, whether you're talking about GAO's long-term outlook, CBO's long-term outlook, or the statements produced by Treasury and OMB now on fiscal sustainability, all have come to the conclusion that the long-term fiscal outlook of the federal government is unsustainable in the fact that uh, the debt is growing faster than the gross domestic product. And right now we're at uh, relatively historic levels of debt compared to the norms that we've been used to in the United States since its foundation. And uh, while in the short term, we need to do everything possible to deal with the public health goals that we have for COVID-19 to help our people, to help uh, our public health system, uh, and to also uh, deal with the economy, the economic repercussions of COVID-19 and other factors. We quickly need to turn our attention. Once we're on a more stable basis and we're achieving our public health goals and we're more stable uh, from an economic growth standpoint, we need to quickly pivot to developing a plan to deal with our long-term fiscal situation. Bob, I mean, I've, I've outlined what that plan should include, such as fiscal targets. We need to have a, a debt to GDP ratio or some other fiscal target that we're shooting for. Right now, there are no guardrails, uh, no national goals on how much debt we want to carry or feel we can service as part of our uh, you know, uh, government position on these matters. And the, the plan I've outlined several characteristics, it needs to be based in law so that it, it uh, 
stays in place over a period of time. It should be integrated with the budget process, should be transparent. There should be actors like CBO that can report to the Congress on how well we're dealing with the plan. There ought to be you know, escape measures if there are national emergencies such as we're facing right now that need to be dealt with or recessions or conflicts or whatever. Uh, and so it needs to be flexible, uh, but we need to have a plan. Right now we don't have a plan uh, to charter this course. And I'm very concerned and our reports have pointed out to this that the trust funds uh, that have been created by the government to be on self-financing basis are really frank. The highway trust fund hasn't been supported by its own revenue generating source for a number of years now. And it actually this year is projected to be insolvent uh, by CBO. Uh, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the multi-employer plan is expected to be insolvent by 2026. The Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund by 2024 is pro latest projection is that they would only have enough revenues to pay 83 cents on the dollar. And by 2031, the Social Security Old Age Survivors uh, Trust Fund would only have 75 cents to pay on the dollar from the payroll taxes that are generated there as well. So we have some very serious near-term issues. And these numbers I've given you on these trust funds could further change based upon the economic situation. And if anything, they may be accelerated a little bit uh, if we can't get the economy back on track. So it's a very serious situation. As I mentioned, we immediately we need to focus on uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, and healing our economy as well as healing our people. Uh, and to put us in a, in a good stead. Uh, but soon thereafter, we must attend to these issues so that we always have a government that can respond to future emergencies, that can make wise investments in infrastructure and other areas. And so this is very important and I think central to the effective governing uh, of our country by better managing our long-term finances. We've talked about COVID-19, the health crisis, the economic fallout. We've seen massive legislation with trillions of dollars flowing out to the public and into the economy. You're the head of the Government Accountability Office. Where do you even start on ensuring accountability as we see legislation like that coming through Congress? Actually, under the, the COVID legislation, Chase, we are responsible at GAO for reviewing the use of all those uh, in excess now of uh, 2.6 trillion, probably you know close to three trillion dollars that the Congress has appropriated uh, to make sure that it's spent properly and effectively and achieves our public health goals. Uh, we've issued reports on a bi-monthly basis. So we're doing real-time auditing to ensure accountability over those funds and whether they're achieving their objectives. We've made 31 recommendations so far to uh, better improve, uh, you know, we've outlined the need to have more complete information and a national strategy on testing. We need to have, uh, you know, we point out in September that we needed a, a, a vaccine distribution plan that met all best practices and project scheduling and things. We've seen now that there's problems with these things. So a lot of our recommendations haven't been fully implemented yet. Uh, we've had recommendations uh, to collect better data, but on the accountability front, we also have recommendations that a lot of money was spent very quickly uh, in some of the, and that was good to help small businesses and others, for example, but a lot of the transparency and accountability goals weren't met. Uh, and in some cases are far from being met yet, particularly at the Small Business Administration and, the, and which had the largest programs to distribute the assistance. So we've had more recommendations for better oversight to protect the program integrity of these programs and to reduce uh, the occurrence of fraud uh, in, in these programs, which have, have had some serious situations. So they've helped a lot of small businesses. They've helped a lot of people. And I don't want to take away from that. Uh, but there's no reason you can't help people, but also have good accountability 
and transparency. So we're a key part of that working with the inspector generals and others to ensure that these funds and whatever future funds Congress will appropriate. And we've given Congress some recommendations uh, to follow as well. For example, in 2015, we recommended that the transportation department have a, a strategy, uh, airline strategy to, for communicable diseases. I mean, we did after SARS and after MERS and all these other the problems, we recommend it. Here we are, you know, 2020 pandemics underway five years later after we made the recommendation, no national strategy for air travel. And transportation saying, well, it's DHS or HHS's responsibility. They're saying, no, it should be transportation. So I asked the Congress, please clarify this and give direction uh, to these federal agencies to develop a plan. And now you see the airlines asking for clarity. What should the testing policies be? I mean, we need uh, more uh, national leadership on these issues. Uh, and that's just one example of things that I've uh, we've we've recommended. So we're we're on the uh, on the case.